These magnificent animals belong to a local brewery. They have two drays that deliver to pubs within a five mile radius. With today's congested roads, more horses are being brought back into service as a viable option. Working shires can weigh up to a ton each and a pair like these can pull up to two tons. They have to earn their keep and are out on deliveries every day with Sundays off and two weeks holiday at a local farm every summer. They take a lot of looking after and there are four full-time staff to keep them in top condition. Big horses of course need big shoes and the skill of making them is still left to the experts. One of the local men is Ken May. He started as an apprentice at the age of 14 and apart from a stint in the Navy during the war he has been doing it ever since. The decline in the use of horses saw a lot of farriers go out of business but Ken managed to keep going. These days Horseshoes are bought preformed, so that there are less farriers that can make a shoe from scratch. As Ken is one of the old school, we can watch him to see just how it's done. After cutting a length of bar and heating it in the centre, the first part is to bend it into the familiar shape. It's a hot physical job, and the village farrier were always strong men with a grip like a vice. Two shoes are made at the same time, so when Ken is working on one, the other is heating up. Once the shape is made, the nail holes are punched in. Shoes have to be made to fit the left or the right side of the horse. This is shown by the number of holes in the shoe. The offside has four holes and the instep has three. When this is done, the lump is then formed. This stops the hoof from sliding off the shoe. It takes a skilled man about an hour to make a pair.
and there they are, ready for fitting. Most people I know take at least one magazine about the countryside. Indeed, I take several every month. And whilst the articles are very good, they would have much less appeal without the magnificent photographs within. And I've often wondered just how much effort and time is required to take these photographs for these high quality magazines. And it's with, with this in mind that I was invited to go and see just how it is achieved. Bill Osborne is a wildlife photographer. At any one time, he has several projects on the go. Because the seasons determine Bill's work routine, there is no time to hang about. This scaffold is essential if he is going to have any chance of getting a selection of high quality photographs to a magazine. The sequence he needs is of young rooks in the nest. First though, he's got to reach them. It's important to work quickly. I need to get it in pretty quickly now. Because uh, I'm going to keep the rooks away from the, from the nest because we've estimated that they'll be either in the last stages of incubation or they'll have very small chips at the moment. It's a very warm day, so uh, they shouldn't chill. Now, we've, we've, I've cleared the area now for this hide. I've put it here. You can see the rook's nest that we want to photograph is just up here. It's exceptionally low rook's nest really. Uh, it's no more than 18 or 20 feet high and I cleared the uh, the rubbish that, that was here, dead elm and so on, um, so that we can put the tower scaffold straight up through here, through these regrowth elms with uh, minimum disturbance to them and the rook's nest will be about 20 foot away from the front of the hide which is uh, just about right for this. Uh, we've got our back to the sun in this position, so we should, if on a nice day, we'll have the sun all day. We've had the birds away from the rookery for about 20 minutes, which I think is quite long enough. So we'll uh, be back here probably later on this afternoon. Working in short stints, Bill allows the adults to return to the netting in sheed and brood the chicks. The bird's welfare must come first. Right, it's now later in the day. We've been away for about four hours. And I, got, I reckon to spend about 20 minutes here now. It's still fairly warm. The sun's just popped in behind the cloud, but I'm quite happy that we'll be OK here now, uh, putting the base of the hide up. And uh, we'll crack on and do it a bit, just as quick as we can to so that these birds can get back to their nests. Uh, we're going to start off with the base of the hive. It's got to be completely level. Four chops for the bottom. And the legs for the bottom of the tower hive. this base being absolutely level. I've got a spirit level here that I shall be lining it all up with because 
if you're if you're an inch out when you get when you start off at the bottom of the hide and uh, you've got to go at 20 foot you're going to finish up about a two foot out at the top Make sure that we're all square at the bottom. These boards will eventually be the base of the uh, uh, of the hide that we actually put on the top. Yeah, square enough. Check on the levels, see where we're going to go with this. Yeah, we'll have to just come up a little bit on the back there. Just level that up. And that corner just a little tiny bit. Spirit level is an important item. The last thing Bill wants is a leaning tower hide. By being particular at this stage, it ensures safety right, later on once the tower is complete. Securing nuts up as we go, keep everything firm. Got to keep all of this structure completely rigid. We're, at the top of it we'll be up to about 20 foot. And, uh, we're building this uh, this hide up to rooks that are they're not a scheduled bird so far as photography goes. There are certain species of birds, um, much rarer birds, uh, when they're nesting you have to have special licenses to be able to photograph them. They include things like kingfishers, red kites, um, ospreys, a number of our rarer British birds, but with, uh, with the rooks that we're doing here, um, they're not scheduled so far as photography goes, so um, we're quite within the law doing what we're doing here, providing, of course, that we don't cause them any undue disturbance and so on, which I'm hoping we're not, because we're I'm going to be working as fast as I can so that we can, so that I can get away. Things have warmed up considerably from just five minutes ago. Right, these these guy ropes are fitted to each corner of the of the tower scaffold as we go up to keep it rigid in case we get some any high winds. And we just tie them off to any. Uh, trees that are handy, that's the usual thing. This is quite an easy wood to be working on really because we've got so much, so many trees all around us. That's as level as we can get so I'm quite happy with that. The hide itself must be assembled so after a few hours away to allow the birds to return, Bill is ready to put it together. When working at heights, Bill always has another person present. Within the hour, the hide is complete. Well, that's it, finished. Tower's erected, the hide's up on the top. We've taken about uh, 40 minutes to do all of this. 
Uh, I've seen two chicks in the nest. They're starting to feather up now. They're quite a good size. Uh, the sun's been on them all the time, so they've been nice and warm. Um, so we're going to be back in a few days. As soon as I get a bit of sunshine and the birds have got used to this high, uh, we'll be back and carrying on doing some filming. We're here at the rookery now on a nice bright sunny day. I'm going to photograph the rooks for the first time. Now I've got to show you the equipment that I need to use to photograph rooks from this hide. We'll start off having, having a look at this tripod. As you can see it's, uh, it, it's short, it's got extendable legs. We need it like this for hide work. The head on it is uh, also heavy, this takes the, uh, uh, the lens when we put it in there. It swivels around, it's got a nice fluid action. This is absolutely necessary to take nice photographs that are going to be acceptable for publishing. Now, I'll put that down and I'll show you the actual equipment that I'm going to be using for taking the pictures. The first thing I'll do, I'll show you the lens we're going to use. It's a, it's a big heavy lens as you can see, 400mm 2.8, it's got a great big piece of glass at the front. This is necessary in order to gather a lot of light in, in case I'm filming in low light conditions. It's got a lens hood on it which is self-attached to cut out any side light that might strike the lens. This lens altogether weighs about 18 pounds, it's a hefty piece of equipment so that you can see that's why we need a big tripod to mount up on a big lens like this. Now then, mount what mounts on the back of a big lens like this is a fairly standard sort of a camera. There's nothing really special about it. It's fairly old now, in fact, superseded a few years ago, but it's, uh, it's all manual focus equipment, uh, but it still stands me in pretty good stead for what we're doing. If you look at this camera, we can see why they're called single lens reflexes. You look in through the back here, and you view, view through the lens down through that mirror when you press the trigger that mirror flips up and exposes the film which is in behind there. Anyway that's about it so what we'll do is we'll get on now while the sun remains out and we'll go and take some pictures that's what this is all about. Right off we go. I've just seen the old birds leave the nest so I'm going to get this stuff up as quick as I can. Bag and tripod up together. I've got this pulley system worked out so I can get everything up as quick as I can. Right, here we go. I'm going up the scaffold by the planks that we've put internally, so it's a pretty good ladder. Safety's really paramount in these things. I've got to concentrate on what I'm doing here to try and keep three points in contact while I'm climbing all the time. See the young ones are sitting there. Quite big now, fully feathered. So I'll pull my stuff in board, unhook it all, and pass it up inside the hive.
These are the Cullen Ringers. We meet together every Wednesday evening and there is a wide range of ages. Our youngest is nine through to those of us who are a little bit older. I had a bit of trouble on the front where uh, I was trying to do this and I had Fiona down there as well, so I'm not quite sure what was happening. Missed out now, I think. Yeah, well, you were, I think you were trying to do 4 or 5, didn't you? Leave 4 or 5 a bit earlier. Yeah, should have gone out to the back. I myself have been ringing for about 35 years. It's a very good activity to do with a group of people. It's not something you can do on your own, it's very sociable. It takes concentration, a certain amount of physical effort, and the commitment. We're going to have an easy composition. We're not going for complicated. We're going for nice, good striking. Good striking. Yeah. And something, something we can get because <laughs> it's special. Are you bringing the champagne with that? Oh well, of course. Yeah. There are eight bells in the tower. The heaviest bell, the tenor, is about 1,600 weight. And about three years ago, we had all the bells taken away to the foundry in Loughborough to be tuned and to have new fitments. It took a lot of fundraising. We had a lot of support in the village and in the parish to get the £25,000 we needed to do that job, but it was well worth it. Well, it's like a challenge and something different. And it's like got all different things, new things to learn every day really, every time you ring and learn everything. Do you find it difficult? Um, yeah, sometimes. You're in charge then. <laughs> we take part in the occasional striking competition locally. There are too many people in the knock It's box, nothing special, we just like to keep everybody on their toes and it's good fun to take part. The pub in the village is actually called the Six Bells, despite the fact that we have eight bells in the tower. Uh, and that's because we did originally have six bells. So for the two to match, we'll either have to change the name of the pub or take two of the bells away, neither of which is very likely. It was quite exciting this year for the millennium because along with a lot of other towers around the country, we rang at midday on the 1st of January uh, a court appeal which takes about three quarters of an hour and we were aware that everybody else all around the country was doing exactly the same thing. I enjoyed that, it was quite special. <laughs>